Welcome to EPAR Trade Live. Uh, this webinar is driver safety in racing yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we have Joe Marco, president and founder of HMS Motorsport, and Tom Gideon, senior director of safety for NASCAR. I'm your host, John Kilroy, and I'm chief of content and audience development for EPAR Trade. Um, I just want to give a brief description of EPAR Trade before we get to the meat of the webinar. Uh, basically, we're creating uh, the online strategy for the racing industry. So if you ask the question or anybody asks you the question, what's the online strategy for the industry as a whole? Well, it's just a one word answer, it's EPAR Trade. So uh, first, we essentially digitize the entire racing industry and put it online for you. So 25,000 racing organizations across the world are available and you can access them on EPAR Trade. Uh, it just makes it easier, better, more productive, more convenient to source uh, new racing products and suppliers. It's not an e-commerce site, so we don't want to compete with the, the racing retail shops, the distributorships, and engine builders. Uh, but it's a great place to just kind of source and find that initial place to start asking questions. And then you can ask questions and have direct contact uh, within uh, the platform. And then that's never been done before, but it's this time that we did that as an industry. Uh, second, we're providing EPAR Trade Live. So a series of webinars, great speakers sharing insights on some of the most important technical and business topics in the racing industry. And, and that's never been done before, and we're happy to do it. It's just time that the industry takes advantage of the amazing things you could do in the digital world. And then finally, uh, with the racing uh, shows, trade shows canceled this year, we're organizing uh, online race industry week, November 30th through December 4th. And our goal is to not miss the opportunity of this annual gathering. Uh, so you'll be able to get, have access to a whole week's worth of webinars, about 11 hours per day, no charge to attend. And then also to get the 2021 product introductions, you can go to EPAR Trade and catch up on what's going to be new for the next racing season. Uh, just one login will get you access to all the webinars. And uh, we're also working with racer.com. Uh, we're going to have some webinars just about kind of state of the industry kind of topics. So we have uh, Chip Ganassi, Brian Herda, USAC's Kevin Miller, Formula Drifts, Jim Lau, Scores Roger Norman, uh, Scores Roger Norman, Indianapolis Motor Speedway's Doug Bowles, Daytona International Speedway's Chip Weil, NHRA VP of Competition, Ed Walser, and more. And they're signing, we're signing up more uh, every day, and we've got some big names uh, yet to drop. So uh, this will be quite a jam-packed week, and uh, it's going to be a trade show experience. Uh, we can't be there in person this year, but you'll be able to get the information, get some more insights, and then shop the 2021 product introductions uh, all at no charge. And the online world lets you just stay at your shop the whole time. You don't get an airplane, don't get a hotel. It's less expensive, very convenient. And you can have the whole shop uh, watch some of these webinars. Uh, and... Uh, so that's it, get ready for race industry uh, week. Uh, now, uh, a quick uh, uh, housekeeping items. Uh, the attendees here at this webinar, they're on mute and they're not in video, so there's no distractions. And then we want your questions. And uh, we have a, a sophisticated uh, racing uh, trade audience. So we know that we're ready for very specific, uh, very tough questions, and uh, we'll, we'll get you some answers. At the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's a chat option. Just open it up, type in your question, and uh, Joe's going to be keeping a lookout for you, and I will also. So go ahead and type in your questions, and we'll get to them. If you're having trouble with Zoom, somehow we can't help you right now, so all I can do is direct you to www.zoomus and, and, and hope you get your answers there. And then we're recording it so people can watch it uh, after this event, and then we'll send you a password so that you can go back and watch it on EPAR Trade. And uh, if you want others in the shop to watch it, you can do that, the rest of the team. So again, our speakers, Joe Marco. Uh, and I'm really proud of the quality and the caliber of speakers we've had for EPAR Trade Live. And to answer questions about keeping drivers safe, we can't have two finer uh, experts uh, than these two gentlemen. And, and really, I can tell it's really a passion for them to just keep our, our you know, those guys in the cars, our friends, their relatives, their heroes, and, and these two guys have a passion for keeping them safe. So uh, Joe's president and founder of HMS Motorsport. Uh, he, he sells racing products, and he's got a perspective, not just domestic and U.S., but international. So Joe knows what's available and what you can get your hands on, and he can get them to you. 
Uh, he's also co-author of the Guide to Seatbelt Installation for the SFI, National Safety Steward for BMW uh, and other club racing, frequent lecturer on motorsports safety. Um, and then Tom Gideon, retired safety manager at GM Racing, senior director of safety for NASCAR. So we've got the right people here. And then my little uh, pitch on driver safety is, I believe it's the first topic, the primary topic for all of us in the racing industry. And sometimes we think we're in the parts business and we're about cylinder heads and coilover shocks and all of that. But as an industry, we need the sport to look like a hobby. We need enthusiasts who never raced before and maybe their, their parents didn't race. They don't know anybody racing, but they wanna get behind the wheel and go racing and they're, they sell insurance for a living or they're a machinist somewhere, they own their own business. We want them to go into racing as a sport. We want, them, want, want to welcome them. We want to tell them if they address the risks reasonably and head on, it, you can do this sport and, and walk away from it and, and feel safe and your relatives can feel a degree of safety about you. And that's the key to having massive part sales that more and more people feel like they're invited to the party. That's a sport and, and it's not about cheating death. It's about having fun. And so driver safety is first about making the racing industry happen in a big way in this country. And so I, I remember somebody told me the story in USAC when they first decided, let's uh, put seatbelts on the car. Let's have a rule. Everybody's got to wear a seatbelt. And, and the way it's told to me, it's almost a brawl broke out because the drivers had a real specific viewpoint that it's better to get thrown out of the car. So kind of driver safety is something that some people don't want anything to change and other people are dragging it forward to make the driver safer. So that's just part of this industry and maybe part of our culture. Uh, Joe, I'll start with you. In your years in the sport, how has racing changed in terms of driver safety and kind of a, a, our approach to this task? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, basically, we've had, I would say in the last, 15 years, we've had probably more improvement in driver safety than we've had in any 15 years prior to that. Um, I mean, a lot of that work goes towards uh, the work that uh, that Tom and Steve Peterson and uh, John Padlack at NASCAR, um, Jeff Horton at IndyCar, uh, people like that who've done an incredible amount of uh, sled testing, uh, having the ability to have data from cars, both in IndyCar and NASCAR, as far as you know, crash recorders where they can actually see what kind of crash pulses there are and being able to recreate that on a, on a sled test or other type of test. All that information has been really put to incredible use and, uh, and we've learned much more about belt configuration, seat construction, use of nets, uh, head and neck restraints, all those things. Those are all the kind of things that, that you know, we're gonna try to touch on today. Um, Tom's probably been involved in more sled tests than uh, most than most other people, uh, and and all the work that uh, he's done not only at NASCAR but when he was back at GM, and I, I've fortunately been at a lot of the ones uh, in NASCAR since 2002. Uh, we we provided belts and any input and expertise that we could do over that time. Uh, so we're going to kind of get into all those uh, as many of those topics as we can within the hour. Uh, I do see it, uh, Eli posted a question on FIA versus SFI belts. We'll get into that a little bit. I promise you all, I will answer that question. Uh, but, you know, I think maybe what we'll do is let Tom kick off and talk a little bit about, since he's been there for a long time, he can talk a little bit about what the history is and how it's gotten started. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to make one correction. I'm the former senior director of safety at NASCAR. That job is now uh, John Padillac's job. So uh, just to make that correction. Uh, but, but to start this off, John, you mentioned uh, seat belts in sprint cars. And, uh, you know, just to start off, NASCAR had a seat belt rule when they started in 1948. So you had to have a seat belt. The cars had to be equipped with roll cages or roll bars and everybody had to drive a helmet, uh, wear a helmet. So NASCAR got started uh, with some, some real hard safety things. You can see here, uh, this is Ralph Earnhardt, uh, who was Dale Earnhardt's father in a car. 
uh, with just a two-point belt. But those were the rules. You can see the roll, the roll bar behind him is kind of welded together, uh, probably with stick weld. Uh, but you can see that, and then uh, everything, everything uh, since 2001 has been uh, made better. And I think uh, if you show the next slide, uh, Joe, uh, you can see a more modern uh, situation here with the driver. Uh, here are two views, a side view and a, a frontal view of a driver with a uh, with a, a very good seat, a uh, very good restraint system. Uh, these drivers are now required to have a, a minimum of a seven point belt system. Uh, and Joe can describe that. Uh, and some of them use a nine point belt system. And Joe, uh, I'll leave all the belts to Joe at this point. Uh, so we've come a long way. Uh, and it's been a process where we've done a lot of sled testing uh, and, and many of the things we've learned, and uh, John Padillac has, has done most of this work. Uh, and as we get into the future, I can, I can tell you that uh, we don't stop here because the future is going to be more modeling and that sort of thing. But, you can take maybe it, what I'll do is um, I think we'll, we'll maybe talk a little bit about <clears throat> frontal head restraints. We used to call them Hans devices because that was pretty much all that was out there. And then we had the hybrid, and then we have you know several other devices now. Well, I have a little video here, which is which is kind of interesting. This is a a thing that was done by the military, and uh, I'll let I'll let uh, Tom explain uh, once I get it started here. I'll let Tom explain what's going on here. We'll start here and it's started. It just takes. Yeah, what you see here is uh, a sudden stop on a sled with a human being in the military, of course, had uh, they they had very low speed collisions because anything higher than that would probably uh, do injury. So I don't know. I think this was about a five mile an hour hit. Uh, in, in, in this particular instance, uh, uh, certainly uh, it's a 15 G frontal acceleration. I don't know what the Delta V was or the speed, but you can see how far the neck moves. And, and really the, the restraint, uh, the torso restraint uh, allows the head to move forward and whip forward. Um, and uh, I think we've got a slide on that too, Joe, if you want to go down to the uh, car and driver slide. Um, I think that's a, a pretty good explanation. Keep going. Yep. All right, let me drop this over here. Get okay. rid of it. Uh, I'll close this out somehow. Uh, da, 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 da. There you go. So if you not slide that, down, no, not that one. That that's more for nets. If you go on down, Joe. No, keep going. You you'll see a. You should see a no no. It's up higher. It must, it must be up. It must be up in front, Joe. Yeah, right. This the 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 slide there. That's a good one. So this is a this is a Hans device, and and this is uh, borrowed from a car and driver publication. But it it's a good example to show uh, when when the driver is in a frontal collision and the torso is restrained, the head will whip forward. Um, if you can somehow tether the helmet to a device that goes under the seat belts, then you can keep that motion from going as far and the forces from being as high. And when the force, when that centrifugal force of the head whipping forward gets to about 900 pounds, you, you break the base of the skull. And uh, of course that's, that's fatal generally. And that was happening uh, many times. Uh, in fact, the slide previous, Joe, if you'll just bring that slide right before it, that one there. Uh, in 2000 and 2001, uh, we actually lost five drivers 
due to a basilar skull fracture, uh, Adam Petty, Kenny Irwin, Tony Roper, Dale Earnhardt, and Blaze Alexander. Uh, and so at that point, uh, some of the drivers were already wearing head restraints, but uh, NASCAR mandated head restraints for 2002. And really, uh, Dale Earnhardt uh, was the last driver to die in the major NASCAR series. So uh, that, that shows you the effectiveness of that. I just want to commend you, Tom, and, and the NASCAR organization. It, it, it was a terrible moment when Dale died. And uh, a lot of us watching didn't think it was that bad of a crash. But some people who really understood uh, what you're talking about with these vascular skull fractures, they knew it was bad. But it hasn't happened since in, in NASCAR sprint racing. And, and that's a big deal to all of us in racing. So I just want to say thank you and thank NASCAR. OK. So now, on, on head and neck restraints, uh, so there is a, a standard in uh, SFI 38.1 standard. <clears throat> um, there's a similar standard, although a little bit different with FIA. Uh, with FIA, you actually have to pass the 38.1 first. Um, and the, there are several devices out there now. So rather than calling them a, a head and neck restraint, it's really a frontal head restraint is a more popular, prop, uh, proper term. The Hans obviously being the most popular, but and uh, the hybrid, uh, which one of the versions of the hybrid is also FIA approved. The Hans and the hybrid are the only two currently FIA approved devices, but then with uh, SFI, uh, there's the next gen, uh, we have the Schrote Flex, and there's a number of different systems that are out there now. Um, they all pass the standard. Uh, they all have a little bit different, you know, setup. Uh, they all work uh, a little bit different in their interaction with the seat in the car. Um, you know, it's hard to say because the data, comparison data from one device to another device is not really published. So it's hard to say one device is better than another one. Although we know from practical purposes, you know, the Hans device has the most um, data uh, to show its effectiveness. But one of the things about head and neck restraints that are kind of interesting is that, you know, if you have a frontal impact, you know, probably the tether on your device is something that should be replaced. The device is probably, they're pretty resilient. You're, it's pretty rare to break a device, but it, it can happen. Uh, but you should, if you have a fairly, if you feel that device activate and you can feel it holding your head back, it's probably effective to spend 40 or 50 bucks and have the tether replaced. The other thing is, is that all these devices come with a standard length tether, which is the length of the tether, you know, moving side to side uh, that the manufacturer has certified the device with. Now, SFI allows different lengths. <clears throat> you can have a shorter or a longer tether, but those shorter and longer tether lengths are not tested. They're not required to be tested. Um, we found in some of the various tests that between NASCAR and stuff that we've done at Schrote and other places that changing the tether length can actually have an effect on the performance of the device. Now, not to the point where it's not going to provide a level of safety, but it, it may move it slightly outside of what the, what the spec is, and there's not really a reason. You know, one of the big things with the head and neck restraint that people comment to us as is, you know, I, I can touch my chin to my chest. You know, how's it gonna possibly, you know, if I put my head out, I can't activate the tether. You know, how's that gonna help me? So I want a shorter tether, but that's not effectively what it works. And most of the head and neck restraints because of the interaction with the shoulder belt, your body, uh, the, the restraint is held back and, and that's held back. Your head is moving forward and it's, it's your head moving forward separate sort of from the device with the Hans device, you kind of slide down the yokes. That's what activates the tether. Uh, and it does it in a controlled manner. If you make the tether much shorter, it's gonna be a, a sharper activation of that tether. If you make it a lot longer, it's gonna take longer for it to, to take hold and you might have more excursion of the neck down. So all the devices are approved in a certain way. And I strongly recommend that you use the device in the way that it was designed and don't try to second guess the, the engineers on you know, using something shorter or longer, even though it's allowed to be done, I don't recommend doing that. Hey, and Joe, for, that, I'm sorry, comes, go ahead, John. When it comes to frontal head restraints, uh, what, what's the situation right now in the racing industry? Uh, they're not required in every racing series. And sh sh should they be? 
Yeah, I mean, in my absolutely. I mean, in in any any club racing, SCCA, you know, uh, endurance racing, and professional racing, certainly head and neck restraints are required. Uh, where we have the biggest lack of requirement is when we get into local circle tracks, uh, and unfortunately that's probably one of the areas where, I mean, I mean it's no, not less needed anywhere, but in particularly there because everybody who's pretty much racing at the local circle tracks is looking to go to work tomorrow and not have any kind of, you know, ideally not have any kind of an injury. And, and as head and neck restraints now, they're, they're as inexpensive as, you know, $350. It's not, there's not a huge cost of entry to get there. It doesn't require special harnesses. All it requires you is to get a, a, a good frontal head restraint and spend 350 bucks and you're, you're, you're there and you're protected. And it's a one-time investment. Maybe you have to replace the tethers if, uh, if your sanctioning organization is, uh, re is following the guidelines. Every five years, the device would be sent back to the manufacturer for recertification. But for 350 bucks, I mean, that's less than a set of tires and it's a one-time investment and it could very well mean, along with all the other safety equipment, you, you know, hopping in your car the next morning and going to work. Hey, Joe, uh, that's a good segue if you'll go down to slide 10. All right. Yeah. So... With, with the Hans, and Joe said it's only good for frontal type collisions, this, this sketch shows you that the Hans will protect you in a frontal crash and 45 degrees to the right or 45 degrees to the left. Now in NASCAR, the drivers are well protected by a, a very rigid seat that meets a, a very good SFI standard. And so they, uh, they cannot go laterally in a crash because the head surround takes care of head movement. Uh, in sports cars and club racing, uh, that's not necessarily true. The seats there may be flexible. They may have some, something that looks like a head support, but, but it probably is not. A, you know, a good rule on head supports, if you can reach in to your head support and with all the force that you can muster, if you can move that head support, then it's not going to be there in a crash because the forces in a crash are so high, they'll move the head support out of the way. And that's why uh, years ago, we started putting nets into cars where you didn't uh, have the ability or uh, the room to put in uh, you know, a fully protected uh, seat like NASCAR. So uh, we've done a lot of testing with nets and you know, there's information if anybody wants that. Joe knows about today's nets uh, and where to get them. Uh, they're, they're not expensive. Um, and our testing showed uh, you know, many years ago that you could put in a net and actually provide lateral protection in a, in a hard uh, side impact even with, without a very good seat because the net, the net actually supports the seat and doesn't allow the, the head to whip. And that whipping motion, again, uh, it, it, it can cause a basilar skull fracture in halves. And there's, there are examples of that. So. Yeah, so I put up a couple of pictures. So this, the picture on the left is a, a NASCAR cup seat. That's a, this is, happens to be a fiber work seat with, uh, and uh, what you, if you look at, since we're talking about, you know, head protection aside, look at how much padding there is uh, at, the, at the top at the, at the headrest. Now, there's a certain amount of, uh, a small amount of comfort foam that sits, that sits uh, somewhere, you know, right at the outside that they, as they're bouncing their head around going along. And then this is a 45.2 foam, which is a really high density energy absorption foam. Uh, Steve Peterson did a demonstration uh, at a NASCAR uh, safety seminar once and he put some of the high density foam down on the floor. And then he also put some of the like the, the typical old roll bar padding stuff, which looks like uh, pipe insulation. He put that a sheet of that down on the floor and he took a five pound shot put and he dropped that five pound shot put on the pipe insulation or the roll bar, the standard roll bar padding and it bounced up three feet and he caught it. 
he dropped it on the 45-2 uh, foam and it came up six inches. And why is that important? Well, because what's happening is the 45.2 foam, that thicker foam, is absorbing that energy. And so it's, and it, and it's transferring much less of that load. It's absorbing the energy and it's not putting that energy back into your head. Whereas the other one, you put the pipe insulation quote around your, your roll cage. If you hit that, you're going to bounce right off of it and you're not going to reduce the impact with the roll bar significantly. So you know, that's one thing I, we go to circle tracks and you try to get somebody to buy high density roll bar padding uh, for $35 a three foot stick and they don't want to do that, but yet they'll spend $120 on a pair of gloves that they saw their favorite NASCAR driver run. So, I mean, you know, I think that if you look at a local circle track and you say, hey, just do proper padding where you, where you need it, which basically is anywhere that's within about 14 inches of your head. If you sit in the seat, and you move your head around 14 inches, anything that's within that range, assuming that you're properly belted into the seat is fair game to hit. And that's where you need that high density padding. So it could be very well the, the bar down the A pillar, it could be along the, along the, do, the door frame, it could be right behind the seat because sometimes the seat are not, is not high enough that you might be able to get to it. So, you know, some things like that. But the other thing we, Tom mentioned with the net, so I gave you two pictures here. The one on the left is a NASCAR uh, cup seat, uh, Xfinity truck type seat. And the one on the right is a typical uh, surrounds, head surround seat in a sports car. Now, the NASCAR seat, the, the sides extend quite a, quite a distance, okay? So the, the likelihood that you're going to get outside of that head surround is, is pretty small, which is, which is great. But in a sports car seat, if you look over, you can see that where this is, is not, it doesn't extend that far over. Now, maybe if I got T-barred, T-boned, it would help quite a bit. But if I don't, if I'm not T-boned, let's say that I, I do a typical thing where I come into a corner, like a, you know, you come into the wall and then the back of the car slams over. So there's a somewhat of a frontal up to, you know, 45 degrees or so. And then there's another impact from the side somehow you're going to be beyond your, your belts, even the, the belts will stretch a little bit and the belts will compress into your body to the extent that you could very well come past this head surround. And so therefore the side nets are going to, which we, I, we call interior nets, you can have one here. Now this one is actually uh, not positioned quite right. It should be actually a little bit higher because the, the net, and we'll talk about how to position the nets. But in this case, IMSA, for example, requires this what we call an interior net on both sides of the seat. And this is going to capture, and I think Tom has a good slide, slide right 12. here. Well, that, that, yeah, slide 12 kind of shows you the orientation. You want the, the top strand of the net to uh, be just above the center of gravity of the head. And if you wonder where the center of gravity is, it's right where your ear is. Uh, and then the, the bottom strand needs to come past the shoulder. And if you do that, uh, a side impact, uh, you, you should be just fine with, with a head restraint. And so that works whether you have a seat that has a little bit of a surround or a seat that doesn't have any surround at all around the head. It's going to work effectively on that. As long as you wrap it closely along the back of the seat, kind of, and it also provides if you do it properly, install it like, uh, so the interior net on this side, you would wrap the straps all the way around the back of the seat back over to the main hoop. And so what you're doing is you're providing strength towards the back of the seat, but then that net is right here. And you wanna angle that triangle, you wanna have the triangle here angled so that assuming that you've moved somewhat forward and now I'm gonna to start to go this way, I wanna make sure that when I'm in that position, that I've got that upper strap just below the line of eyesight and I've got that shoulder captured, you know, ideally like five or six inches below. So you don't want to have the, the triangle so that it's so far back that you're not going to get the benefit if you start coming forward and going this way. Uh, it's, it's important that, you know, the, to get it done. And a lot of the, there, the nets have improved dramatically. Uh, you can get now, uh, we have a new net with like a um, uh, ski binding uh, ratchet strap that allow you to get the net nice and tight. But we found even if the net is in and it's reasonably tight, it will still give you, as long as you have it installed in the proper way, it's still going to give you pretty good uh, support. Yeah, Joe, if you'll point to that previous slide, um, 
that uh, it gives you a date. That's 2003 at Sebring. And you can see uh, the Corvette team was probably one of the first adopters. And, and all I needed to show them were sled tests with crash test dummies that had helmets on and driver suits that looked just like drivers and show them a side impact with and without a net and the net went in immediately. Yep. So net, nets are pretty, are, are pretty important. Uh, so I, we covered that. So maybe what we'll do is we'll, um, does Ava did, uh, I didn't, I, since I'm showing the video, I don't have access to the chat. So uh, John, you're gonna have to- Here's to one question we... about, before we leave the, the, the topic of head neck restraints, you know, you kind of went through them. Um, as somebody's shopping for a head and neck restraint and they want one that fits them, their situation the best, are the head and neck restraints the frontal head restraint, are, are they different? Is there something that the driver should be, questions he should be asking and shopping for these things? Yeah, so so basically if you're you're looking at a, a Hans device, a Hans device has different angles, typically a 20 or a 30 degree angle. Uh, and what that angle is, is, is how far back this piece goes. So a, uh, a 20 degree is gonna be, is actually angled more rearward than a 30 degree, which would bring it up a little bit this way. And what uh, the Hans device, depending on what kind of car you're driving, how your seat configuration, it's a little bit more, takes a little bit more uh, focus to get the right size. And then if you have a couple of different cars with different seat reclines and stuff, you might end up even possibly needing, you know, two Hans devices. You know, if you're, if you put, if you're sitting in the seat with a Hans and the angle is too far back, maybe it's a 20, you know, and you, it may prevent you from sitting all the way back because the, the upper part of it runs into the back of the seat. Or conversely, if uh, you might, if you have a, the wrong angle, it might be pushing your, the Hans itself might be pushing your head forward and not allowing you to, to really, you know, and your eyes are down. So there are other devices, you know, the hybrid device and, you know, some of the, the next gens uh, are short flex device kind of gives a little mix in between. Uh, which, which lets the collar sit below the bottom edge of the helmet and doesn't interfere with the seat as much. So depending on what kind of seat, you know, you want to go to a store, again, <clears throat> head and neck restraints are like helmets and belts and everything else and suits. Go to a store, try it on, look at it, sit in some seats with a particular device and make sure that that fits within your environment rather than just going online and buying something. Uh, because you, until you sit in the seat with the Hans device on, you don't really know exactly what size. Generally, if you're older and you're, you're bigger upper body and you, you're, you know, you kind of, a 30 degree Hans much more often seems to fit people who are with a big upper body, regardless of what the seat angle is than, than a 20 degree. But if you look at the guidelines, you know, they'll say, well, if you're, you know, a smaller person, then it's a 20 degree, or if you're not sitting in a reclining seat, it's a 30. But Go and try different devices and see, you know, what ones are working. John, or Tom, do you have any? No, I just saw that question pop up about seat back belt ang or seat back angle. Joe, I don't think you can get the questions. Uh, yeah, seat back angle. Uh, you know, Indy cars have got uh, more of a lay down seat. Uh, Jeff Horton has done a lot of testing with those. Uh, in NASCAR and sports cars, we have more of an upright seat. Uh, and it is true that the loads on the drivers will be different in, in frontal uh, crashes. Uh, and John Padillac's done a lot of modeling on what happens in frontal uh, accidents with different angled seats. And it, it really does have a difference on, on spinal loading. So uh, that's very important. That work is ongoing. Thankfully, most of our crashes are not severe enough to cause any kind of spinal fracture. So, uh, but we, we need to study that for the future to make sure that, uh, you know, as, as we go faster, as they say, uh, you, you, you need to have better protection, better foams, better geometry. Very good. Uh, we've got a lot to cover and we do want to keep it to an hour. Uh, there's another subject that we were looking at and kind of what we should discuss and, and that's belts. Do you want to talk about belts for a bit? And it, and oh, it, I, it, I always love to talk about belts. Um, yeah, so basically in, in the days before, um, before, let me say the days before Earnhardt, 
most belts out there were five point belts uh, in, in other than IndyCar. IndyCar, uh, open car, wheel car, have pretty much been six point belts for quite some, some time. Uh, but in most other forms of racing, a five point belt was the standard. You know, you'd have a, a, a crotch belt that kind of followed your chest and ideally was mounted, you know, straight down at that point. And, and that does great in a, in a vertical direction if you flip over but it was never really all that great in a frontal impact. And then, and then be, and the result is, is that there were very often sternum injuries with just a five point belt. You were going to say something, Tom? No, I, I, okay. I yeah. I didn't, I'm trying to there. So now uh, basically NASCAR uh, after Earnhardt uh, mandated uh, a six point belt. And since they've had six point belts in, in, in NASCAR, to my knowledge, they've only had one single sternum injury uh, in any of the any of the incidents, uh, and the, the reason is is with the six point belt, the substraps are mounted rearward, so they're kind of holding the lower part of the body uh, in. So the, what happens with an, an impact is there's really three stages. So uh, when you have your initial impact in, in the front, and until you capture the lower part of the body you have no load anywhere on the chest. So the more you allow the, lo the lower part of the body to move, subsequently, the greater the load is going to be on the chest. And until you fully load the chest, you don't have any load, significant load on the neck. So everything just extrapolates and gets worse as you go. So the five point belt, because it's not going rearward and not holding you in really at your pelvis, ideally, it's allowing the body as you as the as the impact goes to move forward and very often you'd have a groin injury and maybe on top of that because the body's moving forward i've got a higher chest load that higher chest load would create a potential sternum injury so once we back, went back to the six point belts got a tight lap belt properly installed six point belt we really reduced greatly the load at the chest and really then reduced the likelihood of a sternum injury and then also by doing that, we've also reduced the neck load. The neck tension is, is gonna uh, further be reduced. So everything is, is critical get to, to get those belts you know, really tight. Now NASCAR, um, based on some crash data recording from I, th I think that the, was uh, Keselowski at Atlanta uh, when Edwards kind of bumped him off and he came down there, they got some really good uh, uh, data as, as far as vertical impacts. And they said, all right, well, we need to see what we can do because there's not a lot of headroom in, in, in most cars, especially NASCARs, between the top of the helmet and the roof. So what can we do to keep the body down and to keep as much distance as possible between the top of the helmet and the roof? And so uh, John Padlack and, and Tom initiated a whole bunch of tests. And maybe I'll let Tom, I'll let you describe how that process went. Yeah, I mean, there were several things done. Uh, one was uh, to improve the structure of the car and add a, a new bar across the windshield. But uh, the the sled tests were, were designed uh, and uh, John Padillac reoriented the sled so that you could run the sled with a, with a, a G pulse that was equivalent to a hard roof impact and then look at belt geometry. And at that point, uh, the, the old five point uh, belt really came in into play there because it's now known as an anti-G belt because it's for rollovers. But with the six point belt and then one going down and the five point, you create a seven point belt system which now, of course, is the minimum requirement in NASCAR. You need seven points. And, uh, you know, some drivers, uh, in fact, I think many drivers drive with a nine-point system. And, Joe, you can describe the right. nine-point system. Right. So a nine-point system, actually, well, if I go back and share that again, um, the, the cup thing here. And let me uh, go back to the image. Well, I don't know if I'm going to, I won't, I'm not going to get back there, so I'm not going to share that. But you can, nine you point just, belt basically yeah. is going to be a double belt on the shoulder. So you're going to have a, a one belt that's going to go, and it works particularly only with a Hans device. 
Okay, so you're going to have a belt, a three inch belt or a two inch belt that'll go over the shoulder. Then there's a merge point between that and the upper and the upper belt where the Hans would sandwich in between. So now what happens uh, in, the, in the testing that we all did uh, is in the frontal impact, most of the load is taken by that upper belt that's riding on the Hans because we know the, the Hans interacts with that belt or head, uh, frontal head restraint interacts with the belt uh, riding over top of it in order to provide the best you know, loading up the optimum loading. And then with the bottom belt, we found that in the in the in the x axis when you're or the z axis when you're rolling over, that that helped to keep the body down. That in conjunction, especially with the negative g or the anti g belt, uh, really, we were able. They that it was really co cool the way they did it, is they instead of shooting this this on the crash sled in a normal seating position, they laid it down. We cut a hole in the top of the helmet. We put a, a tether string. And then we, we met and did several different runs with different configurations and we saw how much was room was left and how much room that we could save. And, and that's, that's kind of where it came. We also measured up to 3,800 pounds. Uh, we determined the, the load on that negative G belt was 3,800 pounds mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the kind of pulse that we had used. So 3,800 pounds, the test then was in order to create an SFI 16.6 .6 belt for the negative G belt, the test requires a 4,000 pound load for 10 seconds, let go, 10 seconds, let go, 10 seconds. So basically we can take a fully assembled with engine cup car, maybe with a driver, and we can hang it by that negative G belt and it will just hang there. Okay, so we had to actually go back. We had to redesign. Uh, so our, the negative G strap that we use in a lot of the Shrope belts, the custom belts, is, is actually two layers of Kevlar. We actually had to redesign the hardware in order to be able to take that load. And then there was so much load on where the belt wrapped through the hardware, we were having issues where it would kind of cut the belt. And of course, uh, Tom, in his infinite wisdom, came up with a solution that we famously called a Gideon Bridge. And so it's an actual piece of metal that goes around where the, the, the webbing runs through and it protects, it gives a, it smooths out that edge so there's less load on the belt. So to this day, we use Gideon Bridges in all the, the negative G belts. So uh, everybody has their contributions. Yeah. Uh, so, all right, let's continue on the belt a little bit. So we've got, so a nine point belt is a double shoulder belt. So you got upper and lower belt, upper and lower, upper and lower, lap belts, uh, six point going rearward, ideally to roughly the same area as where the lap belts mounted, and then the negative G strap, which kind of follows the plane of the chest going down. That's the optimum solution. You can't get a better setup than that. The other big thing in NASCAR is that all of those points are mounted inside the seat. They're mounted directly to the seat, and then the seat is mounted to the chassis. So what does that do? It gives you the absolute shortest length of belts the possible. Casey Kane in, in his cup car, his left side lap belt and right side lap belt were 10 inches total. So the amount of, you know, so the, but still, even with all the belts mounted to the seat, if I have a hard frontal impact, I could probably drop a football between my back and the, and the back of the seat. That's how much the body is moving forward. And most of that is a little bit of belt stretch, but not a lot. Most of that is the, the soft tissue of your body being absorbed, the belt being absorbed by, by the body. And that's all that movement. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's pretty impressive when you see that kind of stuff um, there. But the belt stuff is really gone. The other thing with belts, a big, big step in belts, which I think is being pretty much recognized is uh, we went from three inch lap belts to two inch lap belts. And a lot of times now the shoulder belts, because you're using a frontal head restraint, most of those now are two inch belts. So uh, I, in NASCAR in the cup series now, uh, it's been, uh, I think um, Elliot Sadler was the last driver to run. And even in his last year went to a two inch lap belt. So uh, I went uh, from, a, from a three inch to a two. Everyone's in a two inch lap belt almost all uh, sports car racing is in two inch lap belts. And why a two inch lap belt? It's because your pelvis, the, this distance between the top of the pelvis, the iliac crest, this is about two inches. And so by having a belt that's three inches, you're riding actually over top of the iliac crest a little bit, which is encouraging maybe even a little bit of belt submarining. But in any case, you're putting all that load 
right against there. So it's kind of sore. And if you have an impact, you'll see bruising at that area. When you do a two inch belt, the belt is dropped below the iliac crest and you've got the full width of the webbing loading on the full width of the pelvis. You can get that belt an inch and a half, maybe even two inches tighter and it's without losing anything in comfort and you're gonna feel much more planted in the car. So like even now in, in, um, in dirt track oval racing, we're seeing uh, a, much more low, a much more shift towards uh, two, inch, uh, two inch lap belts. Uh, the, the only, uh, I think the only series that doesn't allow two inch lap belts still is, uh, is some of the NHRA stuff for, I don't understand the, the reasoning, but it, it's still, uh, if you're running uh, drag racing stuff, be careful that you check the rule book because even though uh, two inch lap belts are approved in SFI 16.1 and 16.5 and 16.6, uh, there are a couple of series that still, for whatever reason, uh, still require a three-inch lap belt. So just be careful of that. You know, there, there are some differences, although I don't recommend to any sanctioning organization or track to specify something that's different than what the standard is, but there are people that do it. Uh, so just be aware of that. Always check uh, your rule book before you're, you're going to do something like that. The last question, the first question that we had though, I want to cover that one, the FIA versus SFI. So FIA belts are allow our, our five year, what we call five year belts. So basically if I bought a belt in January, you really get six years because you get all of this year. Plus if you buy the belt December 31st, you still get five years on the belt. SFI belts are two years and now they're, they're, the belts are either dated June or December. So you really can get like two years, ideally optimum you get two years and six months or two years and five months. Now, the reason is, is because you know, SFI's done tests, uh, FIA's done tests. Um, SFI deals with a lot of things other than professional sports where there's dirt track where the belts are getting hosed off all the time. They're getting soaked in water. They might have you know, chemicals or something on them. They're more often exposed to the sun more, more often. And there is clear evidence that the more exposure to sun and, and to chemicals and water and stuff like that, especially if it's a nylon belt, there's a lot of deterioration <clears throat> that can go on and the belt might not be good after six months if it's worst case scenario. So an SFI there, it's, a, it's the primary uh, homologation recognized in the US for everything. So all the local circle tracks, if, you'd, if you add up all of the people who race in the US, local circle tracks add up to a much larger percentage than pretty much anything else. And so therefore, to, if SFI were to allow a five-year belt, there's no way to say, well, it's a five-year belt if it's in the sports car that's in your garage all the time versus, you know, there, there's no way to do that. So therefore they've, you know, correctly, and I support it wholeheartedly, they've stuck with the two year uh, standard. Now, if you are running a series that, that is primarily, you know, sports cars or, or cars that are not in that thing, you can specify in your series rules, you can have an FIA belt, which is FIA standard five years, or you can have an SFI belt, which is SFI two years. But what you shouldn't do, if you're an organizer or if you're a sanctioning body, you should never specify a standard and then say, but you can use it, you know, you specify an SFI standard, but you can say, well, but you can use it for five years. Because now all of a sudden you're taking on, you know, you go to court, you're taking on that responsibility to defend yourself in court to say, well, what proof do you have that that SFI belt that, that failed, and it might've been an FIA belt, but let's say an SFI belt that failed uh, and it's past that two year expiration, you know, what data do you have that proves that you should have allowed that belt after it's, uh, it's certified at, period. So I just hold that out as, as you know, if you, people should be concerned with that liability risk because now you are assuming the liability and you're assuming with a good lawyer, you have to prove that your data proves that this is a safe solution, even though you've exceeded it, because SFI isn't going to help you. And I strongly support SFI in their two-year standard, because it is, for the majority of the applications that they see, it is, it's critical, then two years is, is certainly what it should be. Right. Okay, where are we next? Any more questions on belts, anything? No? Okay. You know, Joe, um, you you brought up the rule book, Joe. I just like to interject one little thing, and that is, uh, 
everyone should know what their rule book is when they're racing, but uh, you should always look for things that are even safer than the rule book. You don't need to do the minimum. This gets back to, you know, you were, you were alluding to how, how much things cost. And that's always been a problem. But if, uh, if you seek out expertise and find out that something really is safer, uh, the rule book generally won't say you can't run it. It's not a performance thing. So uh, always try to be safer than the rule book. Advice. And so that kind of brings the next uh, little topic that we'll, we, you know, there's so many things that we could talk about. I know we've only touched on a few, but I think it's in, what we've covered has been important. Uh, but this is a big year for helmets. Uh, you know, the, the 2020 standard comes out. Uh, now, just in general, uh, most helmets are, you, you couldn't sell a 2020 helmet until October 1st. Uh, most manufacturers will have Pretty, pretty much now have the basic medium and large size helmets. But a lot of times the smaller size, very small helmets or very large helmets are not readily available and probably won't be readily available until you know, very late this year or early next year. So most sanctioning organizations will allow, starting in 2021, a 2020 helmet, a Schnell 2020, a Schnell 2015, and probably for next year, a Schnell 2010. And I recommend that they do that. And for the reason is, is that you don't want to force somebody uh, who has a 2010 helmet that's a size 64 or really big or, or really small to have to be limit what selection of properly fitting helmets that they can get. And so therefore most organizations, uh, not all, but most organizations will allow, you know, those three standards. And, and it's a good idea to do through, you know, through the end of 2021, uh, at least through the middle part of 2021, so that there's, a, there's time for manufacturers to get all the sizes out there. Now, the other thing is, is that there's a, a new range of helmets. So there's SFI 20, or, or there's Schnell 2020, and then somewhat similar to that is an FIA 8859. So you'll see a lot of helmets now will have both inside it. It'll have 88, FIA 8859 and Schnell 2020. The FIA again is more of the European thing, most you know, but but there. But there's also helmets you're going to see are 8860 helmets. Now, an 8860 helmet is probably um, it's it's definitely more expensive, and there's really a couple of versions. There's an 8860 and an 8860 uh, APB, which is uh, more for like F1 IndyCar. Um, but what's the difference between an 8860 helmet and a and a 8859 or Snell 2020? Well, the the big difference is is that the Schnell 2020 has dropped for most of the tests from three meters. Now, when you drop a helmet from three meters on all different forms and they measure, there's a head form that goes inside the helmet that measures the load for concussive type injuries. And then there's all sorts of forms that they measure the load in different parts of the helmet for impact or intrusion issues. Okay, so the 2020 standard in 8859 roughly deals from about three meters on all those tests. The 8860 standard brings that up to five meters but the protection that it's got to give you, the same concussive levels and the same intrusion levels have to be maintained. So basically you've got a much stronger shell to protect against intrusion, and you've got a different configuration of the internal foam, the EPS, which is going to help protect you a little bit more from a concussive injury. Now, you know, it used to be an 8860 helmet was four or $5,000 or $6,000. Now, uh, the, the basic 8860 helmet, you can see them for $3,000, $3,500. So if, you're, if cost is not a huge issue and safety should be a huge issue, you know, that's something that you consider. So now if you're maybe considering a $2,000 carbon helmet, you know, maybe it's worth it to spend that extra $1,000, especially if you know, you're doing a lot of like even driver schools and stuff like that. You're going out, you're, you're a weekend, enthusiast, you're doing uh, champ car racing or lemons or something like that, you're spending a lot, fair amount of time on a racetrack, but you need to go to work the next day. The more protection that you can have about against some kind of a, a head injury, the better it's going to be. And a helmet, in most cases, in those kind of scenarios, you're going to be using the helmet for 10 years if you take care of it. So it's an investment. If you look at it over 10 years, an additional thousand or twelve hundred dollars is not a huge investment over that period of time. So don't, don't limit yourself just to 2020, 8859. Consider 
possibly an 8860 helmet. They are now, the, the APB is, is a little bit different. It has a built-in Xylon strip, uh, which is really used for Formula One and NASCAR. Those helmets tend to be more expensive and that's probably more uh, than you need in those helmets, you know, but uh, they're, so there just is a difference there. But so when you're looking at helmets, first of all, as I said, with, uh, with head and neck restraints, go to a store, try on a helmet, work with the experts at that store to help fit the helmet properly. Don't go in with the predisposed position that I got to have a Stilo or a Schubert or, or a Rye or a Bell. Put several helmets on, try them on, make sure you get the right fit. All the different helmet manufacturers have a slightly different form and different forms will fit different heads better. And when you go to that store and they spend 45 minutes or an hour working with you on the helmet, please don't uh, say, oh, great, that's great, I know what I want, and go out and look for it online. Uh, that store has put that inventory in there. They've tried to help you. They've given you the service. You owe it to them to give them your business. Uh, for the small amount of money you might save online, you've gotten well more than that in the service that that, that, that retail store has provided for you. That's great. I very much agree with that. Uh, I, I think the, the local retail store is a big ally for a racer in, in a lot of different ways from remaining safe to just getting, trying to figure out the local setup. I, I, I think bricks and mortar <laughs> stores still have a big place in racing. And then uh, I just have a question. We're getting to 10 a.m. Uh, it, for the grassroots racer, and he has, he has a budget and he's concerned about, you know, how he's going to go racing and have the money to do it. Do you have any basic kind of tip, I, I, without saying be less safe, but is there a strategy uh, for kind of a, a budget grassroots racer in, in remaining safe? I mean, I, in my opinion, the, the most important thing is to use the equipment properly. You know, I can't tell you how many times, I mean, it does, if you have an $80 seatbelt versus a $300 or $500 or $1,200 seatbelt, if that $1,200 seatbelt isn't properly installed and it doesn't, take the right act, correct angles for mounting angles and, and things like that, then it's not going to help you. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be so whatever equipment you use, I mean, get the right roll bar padding, cheap thing, get a properly fitting helmet and wear it tightly and fitted properly. Uh, and, you know, and get the, get a, get a, a, a head restraint, a frontal head restraint. You know, you're talking not a huge amount of money. I mean, if you spend $120 on a set of seatbelts or $200 on a set of seatbelts and $329 one-time investment on a frontal head restraint and maybe $150 on roll bar padding, on the proper roll bar padding, and, and, then, and then an interior net uh, that you can put on either side of whatever seat you have, you're going to protect you. You're going to have a, a driver cell which has all of those things that are going to protect you to the degree, regardless of what the condition of the rest of the car is. You know, just get all that stuff right. And there's a lot of information. Uh, SFI, the guide to seatbelt installation is very clear on how all that stuff should be mounted. Uh, most of the manufacturers have videos, or if you go to hmsmotorsport.com, uh, we have a YouTube page and we have videos. I've done, a, I did a seminar a couple of weeks ago with uh, Apex on proper helmet fitment. Uh, there are ones on proper belts. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we, but there's a lot of other information out from other people out there. Motorsport Safety Foundation has a number of videos. Use the equipment that you have safely. I mean, we'll go to a local circle track and I'll work with the tech guys at the beginning of the year. And all I'm doing is not trying to get anybody to buy anything. I'm just trying to get them to use the stuff that they have properly. And uh, it's so, you know, that, that's, that's the biggest takeaway, I think. I have, I have one more thing that really is a little off the subject, but it's very important for safety. And that is, depending on what kind of car you have, you, you really need to practice getting out of the car. Uh, you, you need to practice getting out both left and right side of the car, because when you have an accident and there may be fire involved, if you have practiced, you can escape that vehicle very quickly. We do this. Uh, some sanctioning bodies at Lama, they have a rule. You have to be able to get out in a certain amount of time in both sides, but it's something you need to practice because once you practice, when that emergency comes, you just go through what you've done. You have a checklist, but in a panic situation with the car on fire, uh, a, a lot of guys don't know what to do. So 
it's very important to, to practice getting out of your car. That's a great point. The other thing is, is if you happen to find yourself upside down and stationary and you're not on fire, um, don't release your seatbelt until they come and uh, flip you over or, or give you some assistance. Unless you're, you're so strong that you can do a limited one hand push up, um, you know, the, your, the likelihood that you're gonna create an injury for yourself, a neck injury for yourself, forgetting about a frontal head restraint is pretty good if you just release that seatbelt and let you, because you're not gonna stop yourself from coming down. So yeah, I understand if there's a fire and there's, there's something going, you, you gotta get out, but otherwise, let them get you right it up right before, before you uh, release that seatbelt. The, the other thing, John, is, uh, you know, our contact information, if you could make that available to anybody who wants it, you know, uh, I'd be wide open for any questions after this webinar to, you know, to at least uh, tell them what I know. Okay, would you like to give an email address right now? Yeah, it's uh, tom.gideon, G-I-D-E-O-N, at gmail. And I'm just, just Joe at HMS Motorsport, no S at the end, dot com. Okay. Well, uh, we had more uh, subjects to cover, but we do like to keep it to an hour so people can get, get back to work. Uh, this has been wonderful. I've, I've been in the racing industry for about 29 years now, and th there are two things I never heard before that I should have heard 29 years ago. So I'm in the learning process as well. So uh, thank you very much. Again, I, I want to emphasize that, that driver safety is the first conversation, the first topic we all have to have, no matter what parts we're selling. Every single driver, we have to give them a message to uh, approach the risk reasonably and be as safe as possible and as safe as your budget permits. And don't put driver safety down the list from horsepower or suspension. Keep it at the top and keep the sport safe. Uh, especially since the loss of Dale Earnhardt, there's been a lot of science applied to driver safety. So also, if, if you have an opinion in your mind what was right for driver safety, but that opinion was formed 15 years ago, please go back and, and review, get up to date, and do some of the simpler things, not uh, budget-breaking things that can keep the drivers safe. So uh, thank you very much. And, and that wraps it up uh, for all of us here at Depart Trade. And we'll see you at the uh, race, Online Race Industry Week, November 30th uh, through December 4th. All right. Thank, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, all. Thanks. Yep.